as I was preparing to come and have a chat to you on the podcast today, I was looking through my notes and I was thinking, well, there's a lot of areas that I'm interested in talking to this guy about because he's a man of many talents. I was looking at your website, as I said, um, the parenting, the sports psychology, the general life psychology, and then just your hobbies, the triathlon, the running. I thought, well, we're not going to be short of things to talk about. When you, when you explain what it is that you do, Jim, how do you tell people uh, exactly who you work with? Yeah. So first of all, I have a PhD in psychology and I specialize in, in, in overall, mainly performance psychology. So I, my practice, my consulting practice is about helping high achievers um, perform at their highest level. And that's in sports, in business, in medicine, um, in the performing arts. I've worked with a lot of dancers over the years, um, as well as um, students and, and also just helping people find meaning and satisfaction and joy in their lives. Because, you know, as athletes, as you well know, hopefully we'll be athletes all our lives. Um, but the top athletes, they're not going to be high level athletes all their lives because invariably they get to a place where they, they're, they're no longer competitive, but they're going to be people all their lives. So when I, when I talk about what I do, I don't, I don't do triathlon psychology or sports psychology. I just do life and, and try to help people get where they want to go in terms of where they are inside as well as the goals they want to achieve. Yeah, I'm always interested to look at top athletes and people that I just respect. And I always notice that there's not only a, an, a big element of talent and of hard work ethic, but there seems to be a really consistent relationship between a strong psychology and those other two factors combined. And I'm keen to unpack this with you a little bit today because the way that that presents itself with different athletes, I find interesting. Like I look at a Usain Bolt before a race, back when he was in his heyday, and he looked like the most relaxed athlete out there. You would look at him and you'd think, I can't believe he's about to race for an Olympic gold medal and he's about to break the world record. But then you'll have a look at a, a Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who's the two-mile world record holder as of last weekend. And he, standing on the start line, I mean, he looks relatively relaxed, but he has an element of intensity in his For eyes. Sure. And I, I'm constantly surprised at the different approaches or uh, the, the different ways that people present themselves psychologically or physically uh, before a race and, and how that plays out. And, and one of the things I was keen to talk to you about was whether or not there was any fim, fim, uh, similarities between the way top level athletes and, and just top performers in day-to-day -day life approach that because there seems on the surface to be a, a great difference between the way they approach it. But I'm sure beneath the surface, there's plenty of similar habits or um, practices taking place. Yeah. So a couple of thoughts about that. First of all, there's no doubt that the highest level of any area of performance, again, whether sports, business, surgery, whatever, um, they're all fundamentally genetic freaks. So, you know, at least in the U.S., there's this sort of ethos that if you just work hard, you can be the best. It's simply not the case. Um, and you can become quite good. Um, but, for example, a, a famous basketball coach once said, you can't teach height. So, you know, you might have the best hook shot in the world, but if you don't, um, if you don't, if you're not six, if you're not seven feet tall, um, you're not going to be playing in the paint in the NBA. And so, so, so clearly, yes, genes play a big role, but I've known a lot of gifted failures, a lot of can't miss kids who missed um, because they didn't have the other things like you talked about the work ethic. And as, as far as the psychology, there are a ton of similarities between high achievers, but there are also differences. And the differences are in terms of just like genetic personality. So you're absolutely right. Usain Bolt is just a chill, fun-loving, easygoing guy who just rockets down a 100-meter track. Um, Engelbrissen, he's an intense guy. He's super competitive. And, and you see it in, in the race and in how he, how he prepares. So the, and, and you, don't, you don't train that. You, um, I think that's just sort of who you are, how you express who you are um, in your particular area. Of, uh, and there's no one advantage. Um, as a general rule, in, in some sports, for example, you, you have to be relaxed. Um, but, uh, you know, powerlifting, wrestling, no, you've got to be pretty intense. And so, so part of it is your own personality. Um, part of it is through experience, you figure out what works best for you. So if you are an introvert, some, some introverts before competition love being just totally within themselves. And, and they don't want to talk to people. They just want to do their own thing. But an interesting thing about that is there's another side of introverts where some, that's the worst thing to do is, is go like this because introverts often think a lot and thinking doesn't always play well with high level performance. So even though someone's an introvert and likes being by themselves, some of, some of them 
the best thing for them to do, and I do this all the time with my athletes that I work with in terms of shaking up how they think they perform best, is that they socialize. They listen to music, they goof around, they get their mind totally off it until just before they go, then of course they have to bring it in. And so, so that's where sort of the similarities and differences come in. Um, but as far as sort of habits, that is what I call um, the, the mental tools they use. There are some, definitely some common ones. Um, and obviously setting goals is really popular. Um, Self-talk, you know, you're not gonna find a lot of world-class athletes and professional athletes who are downers, who are down on themselves. <laughs> Because if you're down on yourself, you're not going to have the confidence to put yourself out there and give your best effort. Um, and another area is, is focus. W without a doubt that the best athletes, the best performers, are, have a total focus process. Uh, for, excuse me, a total focus on process. Um, and there's a tendency in our culture, of course, it's all about results, which is true. I mean, the, the, you don't get ahead by being a nice person, although that, that can help, I suppose. You don't get ahead by working hard, although that's necessary. You get ahead by producing results. The problem is what our culture, mm. our sports culture has taught a lot of people, especially kids these days, is that in order to reach it, get those goals and get those results, you need to focus on those results. The problem with that is, of course, is when does the result of a competition occur? At the finish. So if you're focused on the finish, what are you not focused on? What do you need to get from the start to the finish? And so there's definitely commonalities in, in attitudes, in, in practices, mental imagery. Unbelievably powerful tool. I don't know. I don't know a world class professional athlete in any sport who doesn't do a ton of mental imagery slash visualization. Two words mean the same thing. So, um, so it is interesting to really look at how different athletes are successful. And there's no one right way. And that's the, that's the journey that every competitive athlete, whether you're a best in the world or you're just an age group or a weekend warrior is figuring out what works best for you. And you can learn and observe others and go, oh, that's sort of like me. Let me try that. But ultimately, in the end, you need to find out what works for you because, again, it's very individual. Yeah. When we're speaking about mental imagery, that's one that I'm fascinated by. And visualization is something that I've never really done consistently. I mean, the idea of setting realistic goals or setting goals, which I'd like to talk to you about in a moment, uh, the idea of developing a process toward a goal. Like I'll say I'm quite a big planner when it comes to getting ready for a performance. But when it comes to the visualize, visualization aspect, I've never really spent too much time developing my understanding or knowledge on that when you say that what do you what are you meaning are you speaking about um uh, visualizing your way through training sessions or races or a combination of both and how do you how do you actually even start the visualization process yeah um all, all the above and in fact um i am publishing an article tomorrow on my blog it'll be out on my social media on the power of mental imagery in triathlon and, and again you can apply to any sport any activity but basically Imagery or visualization involves seeing your, and feeling yourself perform the way you want. And usually I have people start in training and get comfortable with it and, and then use it for race preparation. So for example, um, Michaela Schiffer, and I don't know if you follow Alpine ski racing, but she's the greatest ski racer in the world, maybe the greatest of all time. Anyway, um, she's an American. And um, in 2018, she was 16 years old and she was favored to win the Olympic gold medal in Sochi, Russia. And she was being interviewed before the race. And the interviewer asked, well, what's it like being in your first Olympics? And she said, it might seem like my first Olympics to you, but I've raced this race thousands of times in my mind's eye. Hmm. And, and mental imagery is, is one of the most researched areas in sports psychology. And, and basically, a lot of people think that when you do imagery, you're just picturing stuff in your head. But it's an actual mind-body connection that when you do imagery, you're fooling your mind and your body into thinking you're actually performing. And I know from my own ski racing days and my triathlon days now that I, um, I'd start doing imagery and my legs would start moving unconsciously as if I was actually skiing a course or running or biking. And so that shows that when you do imagery, it triggers your motor programs. And one of my, one of my favorite pieces of research came out about a year or two ago that found that they had people imagine themselves doing arm curls. Well, Tyson, what do you think happened? People got stronger. And, and, and when I tell the story to my young athletes, especially, I always have to tell them, okay, don't go running to your coach and say, Dr. Jim said, I don't have to do actual physical conditioning. I just have to imagine myself doing it. <laughs> because cl clearly it doesn't activate the motor cortex quite as powerfully. But when you, the research shows is that when you combine the actual training practice with imagery, you improve faster and better. 
And, but, but mm. what's important, like anything, anything related to um, becoming a better athlete or better at any kind of skill is you have to do it consistently. So the reality is Tyson, all athletes at every level do mental stuff. And so they do things to motivate themselves, to be positive, to relax, to focus. But mental stuff is like going to the gym every three or four weeks and doing a few arm curls. You're not going to get stronger. It's the consistency of physical conditioning, of technical training, of, of mental training that makes you develop the helps you strengthen what I call mental muscles and develop the use of mental exercise to strengthen those muscles. Yeah, man, there's so much there. I just finished reading this book called Range, uh, which looks at the different approaches that athletes take to achieve success. And he speaks about the likes of Tiger Woods and how Tiger Woods from the age of two, his dad essentially immersed him in the sport, gave him a club, uh, demonstrated the skills in front of him in a high chair for years and years, or for months and months, I should say, and then eventually handed him the club and he had this ability just to focus intensely and do it quite well from a young age. And then they looked at the athlete of Roger Federer and said the parents were quite open with his approach. They encouraged him to try a lot of sports. They encouraged him to, uh, whatever it was that he was interested in, follow that curiosity. And it wasn't until he was about 15 or 16, he started to get really, really specific. But what was interesting was through this book and through the different approaches that these athletes were taking to get to the level of success was the author kept going back to chess players and speaking about I, I don't know much about chess I've never really looked at it I'm not very good at playing it <laughs> I don't have a great interest in it but the way he was explaining what these chess players were doing was they would go and study and they'll go and research and a big part of their success was just that recalling process so what had they learned what did that look like? How did that come into practice? And it was using this idea of visualization um, before, after, mid-game in order to develop their ability. And I heard a story. It's anecdotal. I can't remember who it was. I wish I could put a name to this so it sounded more real. And it might have just been a good story to prove a point, but it was about a, a lady who was locked up <clears throat> in prison, uh, a professional pianist. And uh, obviously being in a prison cell, she had no access to a, a piano. And so she just went through that mental model in her mind. And the story goes that when she came out, she was better at playing than what she was when she went in. I don't know if there's a bit of sugar poured on top of that. But, I mean, it makes sense, the idea of just tapping into that part of your mind that's actually activating the skills to, to, right. to play piano or to run a race or to stand in front of an audience or whatever it, whatever it is. Our culture likes to separate psychology and body as well. And I, I think one thing that I'm trying to realise um, – as I get older, is they're, they're very heavily connected. Like the idea that that classic saying, I think it might be a Bible quote, where the mind goes, the man follows. Like the idea of of that, it's been around for centuries and it's something that I, I think, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but it seems to be very separated in our culture. Yeah, so people think of the mind and the body as, as two distinct things, but the mind is not this this entity just sort of floating around up here. It's It's the brain and the brain is a part of the body. It's physical activity. And so there's no separation between the mind and the body because they're all the same thing. The brain is simply an extension of the body. This is this planet up here above the shoulders. And, and I think the more you can think in that way that, that, and it goes in both directions. So what you do physically, whether behavior or performance affects your psychology, it affects your thoughts, it affects your emotions, but also this, by the same way, but in, in, inversely, and, and this is what, what I do in my work is that what if you think and feel affects your physicality, your performances and your behavior. And so, so when I work with athletes, get in to make changes in, in, in their psychology, it also produces changes in their physiology and their, and their actual, and their actual um, uh, manifestation of, of their sport uh, in terms of training and competitive performance. Mm. What does that conversation look like with an athlete who you're meeting for the first time, they want to improve the mental part of their game? Yeah, wow, that's a that's a big question. Um, I go through a process where I first uh, ask them why are we why why are we here, and they'll describe some maybe general areas where I, I I perform great in training, but I don't do well in competition, or I get really nervous, or I can't focus, or I have no confidence, whatever it might be. Um, then from there, I do an assessment where I, I go through this list of of um, what I consider the the key mental areas related to performance, and I've got about I don't know fifteen or twenty of them. And I have them rate themselves mostly on a one to 10 scale. And, and what's important about that is that one of the challenges with the mental side of sport is it's not tangible. So if I want to see how strong somebody is, we go into the gym, put plates on the end of a bar, see what you can lift, um, see how fast you are going to the track and plot the clock. 
they can see that they can understand it. They can wrap their arms around it, but the mental side, it's like, it's like trying to grasp fog. And, and that's why I think a lot of people don't, uh, don't um, do enough in terms of mental training because they just kind of don't know what to do. It's like, yeah, the mind's really important. Everybody says the mind is so important and maybe more important than, um, than the physical and technical side of a sport, but they don't know what to do. And so, so what I try to do is get them to understand that, that the mind is made up of muscles, metaphorically, uh, mental muscles, and just like mm -hmm. physical muscles, they can be, they can be um, weak, they can be strong, and they can be injured. And the mind needs to be exercised. And so once I see what their strengths are, what areas they need to work on, then um, we'll go into a process of working with them consistently to address a lot of these areas where I educate them about it. Because it's one thing to say, oh yeah, confidence is important. But what exactly is confidence? How do you build confidence? How do you lose confidence? How do you maintain confidence? How do you have confidence in the biggest event of your life when you're in the spotlight? Very complex. And so the, the first step really is giving the giving them a shared vocabulary so they can say, this is my issue. This is what's going on with me here. And that makes it more tangible. And when you, when something's more tangible, you can hold on to it. And if you can hold on to it, you can do things with it. And, yeah. and then from there, um, a combination of giving them exercise to train their mind and mental imagery is one of them. Um, like I said, goal setting, self-talk is a, is a really big one. Um, the routines, breathing, so there's, there's many, many more. And then yeah. have them, uh, when, I'm, when they're away from our sessions, to the, build these things into their training, into their um, away from the sport, and then ultimately build it into their race preparation. And, and that's returning back to the issue of imagery. Race preparation is an incredibly powerful way to prepare for an event. And as an example, again, we were talking before we went on the air, I did Escape from Alcatraz, one of the most iconic um, bucket list triathlons in the world here in San Francisco. And it's so it's so iconic because you have to jump off a perfectly functioning boat into the San Francisco <laughs> Bay and, and and swim to shore. And I will we just had it on the race on Sunday and it, I did it. And it was really hard. And then you have a really hard bike ride with tons of hills and then a really hard run with tons of hills. And and so um, I only learned I was going to be in the race about a month ago. And so I, 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 ran, I ran and rode the course. I swam in the bay a bunch. And but more than anything, I did a ton of imagery every day. For the weeks leading up, I spent five to 10 minutes where I saw myself in the race, how I wanted to feel, what I wanted to think. Um, if, 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 if there were some struggles, like going up this one a pitch of a climb on the bike that's 15 degrees, which is really steep. And, um, and so I was programming my mind to, of how I wanted to think and feel and perform in the race. So when I get to the race, I basically just run the program. And that's how that's one yeah. really yeah. useful way to to use mental imagery and other mental tools in preparation for a race of any sort or, or a game of any sort. Yeah, I, I really like what you said about the mind not being tangible in the same sense that a body is in the same sense you can develop a bicep. And that's one area of life that I think whenever I'm in a rut personally, I always find difficult to get the ball rolling because I'll notice oh, I'm in a rut or I feel a bit crap. I feel a bit rubbish. And if it's a sprained ankle or if it's a broken finger, you can see it, you can feel it. It's a, it's very noticeable. Whereas in the mind, it can be, oh, am I tired? Have I had a bad day? Have I been busy? Are the kids naughty? <laughs> What's been going on in my life? And as a guy who's been really fascinated and really interested in so many tools, and it's, it's kind of a hot topic in 2023, or it has been for the last 10 years, I've found the world of psychology offers so many awesome tools that sometimes I feel like I've gone down to the local coffee shop and I've seen the 15 new coffee choices and I, I just freeze. I'm not sure where to start. I don't know what to implement first. And yeah. even though I know I have an arsenal of awesome tools that would be amazing, I can't decide which one to use. And as a result, I freeze and don't use any of them. Do you have anything right. to speak to to that? Because that's probably the one area of my own personal life that has slowed me yeah. down in this area. Going to the gym, I've got my gym program. Going for right. a run, I know I'm training for a marathon. Uh, okay. Mindset, I've got 15 tools and not sure what I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, so Tyson, you, you just nailed it right there that you've when you go to the gym, you have your program all set out for you. And it's comprised of, ten, let's say, 10 exercises, three sets each. Um, with your running program, you have experience with it. You've got a program. So when you go to the track, you're not just running around doing whatever. You're on a program. And that's one of the hard mm. things about, about mental training is that 
most people don't have the experience to take all these, you know, dozens upon dozens of techniques and strategies and how to put them together in a program. And in a way, that's what I, that's my job. That's what I do. Because the fact is, Tyson, you can go onto the internet and learn every little detail about everything about mental training out there. But like you said, it's like overwhelming. Where do you start? And you're a running coach. So runners come to you and, you know, they can find all kinds of running things on the internet, but they need somebody to just put it together and tell me what to do. And so, so it is really difficult. And what I would say is if you're not, if you're not going to hire me or somebody else who, who does this is just pick one or two or three max mm. and just focus on that. So, so do, do goal setting and do that consistently during the course of a training block leading up to a race. Um, really focus on your self-talk and monitor your self-talk and take notes of how you think during training, after training and so on. And then, um, and get on, a, on an imagery program. Um, where just every three, I usually suggest three times, three to four times a week for five to 10 minutes, just close your eyes and see yourself performing the way you want. Now, is, is that the same mm. thing as being trained by me? No, but not everybody needs to be trained by me and not everybody can afford to be trained by me. Um, but um, the, the fact is, is that, that if you do anything consistently, it's going to help. And then as you become more yeah. experienced, then you can try other things and then you can actually start to put it into a program where three times a week while I'm training, I'm going to practice my process focus, or I'm going to use some of these, uh, these pain techniques when I'm, when I'm doing a hard track workout. And so like with any, anything over time, if you don't have the guidance of a coach in, in technically or, or conditioning or mental, um, you sort of educate yourself and get a sense of like, Oh yeah, now I'm just starting to understand this. And then you can sort of start to self-coach in a way as, as most the reality is most people do self-coach. Yeah. 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 And that's a really good point. I'm interested to pivot a little bit here because obviously the world of parenting is something uh, that you're a professional in as well. Offer a lot of help. I have two boys. I've got a three-year-old boy turns three in August and I have a eight month old boy. And it's amazing. I used to speak to parents and I said, Oh, what's it like being a parent? And they used to say, it's the most amazing thing ever and it's the hardest thing ever. And I used to think, you sound ungrateful. That sounds terrible. <laughs> but now I kind of get it. I love my boys with all my heart. One of them's at daycare today, which I also love. Daycare day is one of my favorite days of the week. But one of the things that I've been really interested in speaking to people in the, the same area that I'm in at the moment with parenting is that that psychology element of their life seems to take a whack. And I know that whether it's the, the selflessness of being a parent whether it's the fact that you can't do when you want uh, or what you want when you want that sleep ins don't exist anymore, that it can be really easy to to sort of get down in the dumps. A lot of people that I speak to, and it's it sort of I, I hesitate to say it out loud because a lot of people think it sounds terrible, but a lot of newer parents I feel sound like they're going through a real rough run. They're not sleeping, <laughs> they're doing all the or they're not doing all the things I just mentioned. And there's just like a general level or general layer of unhappiness, which is, has crept in, which is strange because they would all tell you that the greatest gift in their life is their kids. What, yeah. What's do, going do, on do, there? I'm so do, interested to pick your mind about this. Yeah. So Tyson, the, the, the reason why uh, parents tell you people who don't have kids yet that how wonderful it is, is otherwise you wouldn't have kids. And, and, and plus you have to justify the fact that I had kids. And, um, and so, you know, I have two teenage daughters and being a parent is one of the most wonderful experiences, but also one of the most, absolutely one of the most difficult. And especially when you have young still. kids, one kid, uh, still, oh my gosh. Yeah. And from, from, from you know, speaking of my parents, it's like, you're, you, you never stop being a parent. And so, you know, mm. you know, your kids can be struggling well into adulthood and it still hurts. Um, but at least once they go out the door and they make their own way, then it's a little easier. Um, but, you know, in some ways, as your kids get older, it gets easier. And as your kids get older, it gets harder. They're just different challenges. But but certainly the adjustment when you have young children is is hard because, you know, up until it, when, when you're single, you just live this sort of self-centered, uh, you know, uh, uh, selfish life. And you get to do whatever you want, whenever you want. And And that's a great thing. Um, as you suggest, you can't do that when you have kids because they have to be first. Um, and, and the fact is, it, you know, it's tiring, it's distracting. You can't always take care of yourself as well as you want, especially early on, um, particularly so from, from, for, for mothers, because they're often attached with breastfeeding and, and those kind of things and, and assuming sort of traditional gender roles, which are changing to a large degree, uh, thankfully. 
But um, so it's it's incredibly hard. And um, and I, it's just more than anything, as your kids get older, it's important to have conversations about with your with your partner about what kind of children do you want to raise? What, 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 are, what, what kind of culture do we want to create in our family? Um, what kind of values do we espouse? Um, I wrote one book a number of years ago about the importance of values in raising children. And I'm a huge believer in values, not the hot button values that you hear in the U.S., everybody arguing about, but just like values that we can all appreciate, meaning, um, you know, responsibility and integrity and all those kind of things. And because values are so important to me because they're like a road, road, they're like a roadmap to your life. Because whatever you value, that's what you do. And so you want to make sure you do everything you can to instill healthy values um, in our in your children. That's harder than ever now because thanks to the internet, um, it used to be that our homes were are, were basically just you know protection walls against the, the encroachment of, of society. But now they're they're entirely um, um, uh, transparent, really, because of the internet. And so kids are bombarded twenty four seven by what I consider to be largely unhealthy values, you know, consumerism, materialism, physical appearance, wealth, status, power, all those things. And so it's it's harder to raise healthy kids these days because the world is not on our side anymore. And um, yeah. so, so we need to reach out to schools. If you're people of faith, you know, your, your religious community, um, your athletic community, your neighbors, all those things to protect them from the, all that toxic stuff out there while instilling them in them healthy values and healthy beliefs about the world and about themselves. And 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 uh, I mean, I'll be clear, Tyson, you know, I have some strong opinions about what I think is healthy, but but I'm not here to tell people in any of the five books I've written, parenting books I've written, how to raise their kids. I'm simply offering ways that I believe are important and try to justify it. And then ultimately it's up to every parent, every couple to to sit down and go, okay, how do we how do we want to raise our kids? What kind of kids do we want to raise? And the important thing in, in all that is Make sure you're deliberate about it. Don't just do it because everybody else does it. Don't just do it because it's easy. Do it because this is the kind of children we want to raise. So these are, these are the things we need to do. So, for example, given our athletic backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, I want my kids to be physically active. And I want them to gain the benefits of, of, of sport. And so we raised our kids in that environment. And uh, both my daughters are, are athletic young ladies. And... Um, and so you have to decide within your family what kind of things are important. For some, it's being musical, being artistic, being scientific, whatever it is. They're all good. There's no one one right way or best activity for kids. But just make sure you sit down and, and go, OK, like, let's be deliberate here. So my kids going to school. What kind of school do I want them to go to? Um, what kind of neighborhood do I want to be my kids to be around? All these different questions. It, just be deliberate. Yeah. Don't do it just because it's easier because everybody else is doing it. Sure. You mentioned physical activity. What are some other uh, values that you rated really highly raising your daughters? Yeah, um, uh, compassion, empathy, caring for other people. And, and that's very hard because we live in a world where selfishness, it's all about me, is, is revered. And, and, um, and, and in this case, it's sort of the opposite. It's like, so it's not about the Benjamins. Sorry, that's a, that's a U.S. dollar um, reference. Um, you don't have Benjamin Franklin on your money, but you maybe have a version. Um, so it's, uh, so it, it's, it's about helping people. It's about giving back. Um, it's about caring. It's, it's about family. It's about shared experiences. Um, the, the list really goes on. And so it's a matter of, again, identifying what's important to you and your partner and, and making mm -hmm. choices about that. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. The, the one thing that it's really interesting is my, my boy, my older boy's Charlie. His name is, as he gets older, he starts to get glimpses that dad's not perfect. Do you know what I mean? And, and that can be quite humbling uh, in itself. And I mean, it, you don't have to be a genius every you know, you're further along the path than I am, but every parent that I speak to says that's a little bit of a challenge when they realize, Oh, I was impatient there. I was a little bit snappy there. You know, I, I wasn't organized here. Um, how do you navigate your way through that? Like, is, is that something that, uh, a lot of parents who speak to you um, <clears throat> uh, ask you about, because I, I think that's yeah. been one of the biggest things for me. It's like, ah, oh, that's amazing that this kid's going to grow up and realize that at the moment he, he thinks I'm the king. I mean, he's going to find yeah, out yeah. very soon that I'm, <laughs> I'm not to a yeah. large degree. For sure, Jason. <laughs> so the fact is um, parenting brings out the best in us and the worst in us. And it's, it's an incredible growth opportunity. 
and because kids are a mirror of, of us. And, and one of the great gifts we can give our kids is not our baggage. And so, so learning mm -hmm. to, if, if, and we all have baggage. And, and I think one of the most important things to recognize as a parent is that we're human and we make mistakes and kids are incredibly resilient little creatures. So they, they've learned to survive in the wilds of far, far greater adversity, you know, on the Serengeti 250,000 years ago, um, they've learned to survive in far more hostile environs than, um, than in suburban Australia or, or San Francisco Bay Area or, or so on. And so <laughs> you don't have to be a perfect parent. You just have to be a darn good one while recognizing that you're mm. going to make mistakes. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to get angry. Um, I'm not a yeller, but my kids know when I'm angry with them. And there are some people who are yellers and they yell at their kids and ideally not the best uh, best way to respond. But but you're human. And, and, and that's a really important message to send to kids because we also grow up in a culture where you have to be perfect. You have to look perfect and have perfect hair mm. and perfect teeth and perfect this and that. And that's an, that's, a, that's an impossible standard to live up to. And so if you can be human and sometimes, yeah, get angry and frustrated, also to be sad about something and show that to your kids, while also show, show your passions and your joys when you're feeling good. I mean, if you're happy about something and something went well at work, tell your kids about it. And, be, and, and so they can see that there's this range of emotions and that's, they're all part of life. You can't cherry pick your emotions. You can't just go, I'm just going to feel joy and, and inspiration and pride and happiness and excitement. And I'm not going to have any of those. It's not the way the world works. It's not the way we work. If you want to feel those, you have to be open to feeling the other ones. But then if you do, yeah. Yeah. maybe not be the best parent when, you know, father of the days, one day, you then go back to them and go, you know what, guys, I'm sorry. And your eight month old won't appreciate this, but by, by three, they can start to for sure and say, guys, you know what? I got frustrated. I'm tired. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. That's another part, key part of just being, being a human being is just making mistakes and making, taking responsibility and trying to make amends. And that's an incredibly yeah. powerful lesson for, for everybody. But these days, it's not my fault. It's never my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Let's blame the world. But if you can take ownership of that, by, by making mistakes, you show kids how to make mistakes and how to atone the, from, from those mistakes. And so, you know, the biggest thing is just like, accept your humanity, accept your, your, your flaws, and also recognize all the bring, uh, great things you bring to your kids. And, and you can make mistakes as long as, mo as long as you send mostly good messages, your kid's gonna be okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. What do you think is happening on like a generational level? Because my parents, I, when I was naughty, I used to get whacked with a wooden spoon and smacked, and so did all my mates. And I worked out, I worked out relatively fine. I mean, my wife might argue that point in some degree, <laughs> but I mean, if you, you go down the street, I'm not turning too many heads, just walking past. Um, but our generation, it's funny. I laugh with my wife from time to time, and and I, I'm very lucky. My wife is super passionate about just learning about the the world of parenting and. We've actually just, we're about halfway through a course called Love and Logic, um, which yeah. has been really interesting, just l learning how to navigate your way through, yeah, raising kids, um, which is which has been great. It's been humbling because I realise how many of the natural approaches that I want to have to dealing with issues are, are probably the complete wrong issue. But that Love and Logic approach is the complete opposite to what I was raised with. And it seems to be that over the course of the last 30 years, things have really switched. What, what do you think, what do you put that down to, that switch in the approach to discipline? Yeah. So, I mean, th that's a tricky one because in many ways I'm, a, I'm, I'm tough as a person, as a psychologist, as, as a parent, but tough doesn't mean being angry or punitive. It means having clarity about what you believe is important and making sure your kids live that, live by those things that you believe. And so, you know, clearly uh, corporal punishment, hitting your kids, spanking them and so on, not a great approach. There's tons of research that shows it, it that it, it actually makes things worse. Um, at the same time, you do need to be tough. You need to hold your kids accountable. And again, eight months old, too early, um, three, year old, three years old, no, you, you can start to do this. That, that kids need clarity mm -hmm. because these days, especially once kids get to be five or six, they look and act and talk and walk like little adults. So we think, oh, we can, we, we can just talk to them. But the fact is they're still scared little creatures in this world that's way too big for them. And so it's really important that they see that there's somebody there 
meaning their parents, who can protect them from that big, scary world. And so that's where setting appropriate boundaries and limits um, and having consequences. And, you know, that's the new phrase, of course, we don't punish, we have consequences. And, um, and the, the, the idea is that they learn that their actions have consequences, that their actions matter. And that's a really important lesson for, kid, for kids to learn, because otherwise they feel like vi victims. So, you know, back in the day, previous generations, if their kids screwed up and they got whacked for it, they felt powerless and weak because, because and, and they feel terrible. And so if they grow up feeling like they have no ability to, to have control over their lives, that doesn't play well in adulthood. So an mm. important life lesson is to, for them to recognize that, yes, when you do things, you affect people and you affect yourself. And that, that your actions do have consequences. And that can go both ways. If you screw up, bad consequences. If you do well, if you do something really good, really good consequences. Like you are so kind to your, your little brother there instead of whacking him with your, with your, with your teddy bear. And that of course seems very trivial, yeah. but as kids get older, they, the, the experiences around the sense of I have control over my world um, become more significant. And, and that's where the choices mm -hmm. that, that parents make with their kids in terms of drugs and alcohol and, and sex and all these other high risk things can um, can really play themselves out. Yeah, it's really interesting um, speaking to people about just their shortcomings, whether it's in sport or in parenting or just in their own day to day life. I think a lot of the time, and perhaps it's because we are not applying any of the tools that we have access to 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 actually see benefit in our in our brain or in our mind. One of the things that I was interested to speak to you about as well is you've obviously written in great detail about changing your life's direction. Um, and I think this is really encouraging because one thing that I'm often inspired by, I listen to a podcaster. I don't know if you've heard of Rich Roll. Um, yeah. He's the triathlete. Uh, I think, yeah, based in California. And he, up until the age of 40, was a, um, he was a lawyer. He was, uh, his turnaround point was he was walking up a set of stairs in his house and got halfway and realized he was puffed and thought, <clears> oh, my goodness, like something's got to change. And you look at him now, and not only in terms of what he's done in his career with his podcast and his tours and his events and things that he runs, but maybe even more so, his own physical health. He's an incredibly fit guy, probably in his mid-50s, looks fantastic, looks awesome. Yeah. Um, you can't even recognize him to who he was when he was 40 years old. There's so many, of, uh, so many great examples like that of people who have radically changed their life. So you can see on a practical level that people are very capable of doing it. But what is it that's stopping people? What is it that for people who are in a rut, and I assume we've touched on a number of these things and I could have a few opinions of it my own, but I'd love to pick your brain around, okay, people who are stuck in a rut, they're not happy with their life, their looks, their job, their whatever, what are they doing wrong? Yeah, boy, that is um, an incredibly complex crap question um, because the fact is change of any sort is, hard, is difficult Be, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, I'm, we, we humans like to think that we have this, we're these highly evolved creatures. We have this thing up here called the cerebral cortex, and this thing up front um, called the prefrontal cortex that fundamentally allows us to make choices. And the idea is that we, we of course, are going to make choices that, that are rational and logical in our best interests. Well, clearly, there's, you know, mountains and you know, there's, there's, there's Mount Everest of evidence that we don't make good decisions, whether it's what we eat or, or um, you know, drinking alcohol or not exercising or mistreating people, the list goes on. Um, and, and I'm a big believer that our unconscious controls our lives far more than we're willing to admit. And we don't like to admit it because it's unconscious out of our control. And, and there are three areas of our unconscious that I believe have a huge impact. First, our primitive instincts. So even though we're, we have this, this evolved brain, we still fundamentally react to the world much like we did when we were first living on the Serengeti 250,000 years ago when we first officially became Homo sapiens. So, you know, when we, when we get lit up, meaning uh, our sympathetic nervous system goes up and, and we have our fight or flight reaction. Well, clearly, there's no, in most cases in modern society, we don't have a saber-toothed tiger in front of us or a rival tribesman with a really big club but we react the same way um, because we perceive a situation as life or death as our survival. And it's not physical survival anymore. It's more like psychological ego status, survival, things like that. But, but, but you think about that fight or flight reaction was very effective on the Serengeti 250,000 years ago, not so effective when you're having a disagreement with your spouse or your boss 
or your kids. Fighting, you're going to go to jail. Fleeing, you got to come back sometime. And so, yeah. so, but, 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 but think of it. We've only had this evolved brain for 250, 300,000 years. We've been animals with this primitive brain since we climbed out of the primordial muck billions upon billions of years ago. Those reactions are deeply ingrained. And we haven't evolved enough to have that reaction um, uh, sort of transform and to fit into modern day life. So that's an unconscious force that happens to us. Um, the second is emotional baggage. So as human beings, we almost, mm. all, almost everyone has baggage and meaning um, um, ingrained um, <laughs> ways of thinking and feeling that are counterproductive. So uh, for example, um, fear of failure, epidemic in our culture, does it, do, does it serve any purpose? In a weird sort of way, yes, but it's not functional. And uh, this baggage we usually get from our upbringing, often from our parents, because if, if we have a parent who's fearful, we grow up in an environment where we see that we think the world is scary. So how do we learn to react to, to that is with fear. And, and that's with negativity, anxiety, depression, whatever it might be. And it doesn't have to be mental illness. It just has to be being in an environment that's sending messages about how to deal with the world that isn't that doesn't work that well. And so a lot of the work I do with my clients is unpacking that emotional baggage. And so, so that's that's the second unconscious force. The third is just habits. So if 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 yeah. for whatever reason, whether genetics, the way you were born or you were raised, uh, for example, if you um if if you've just been negative for for most of your life. It's just like a bad technique in, in bad running technique. It's it's deeply ingrained and hardwired into your muscles. So if you go for a run, that's what you're going to do. Bad technique. And so if you if you if you've been negative over and over and over in your life, or you've always been the victim, or or had a fear reaction uh, to to life over and over and over again, it simply gets wired into your brain. And so so and habits, as you well know, of any sort, are just incredibly hard to break. And so there's a, there are these three powerful forces going against your ability to change. And, and, and Tyson, that doesn't even include outside forces. Because let's say, let's say you're in a family that's sedentary and you decide you want to exercise. And what are they going to do probably is ridicule, ridicule you or alienate you because you are presenting them with an alternative to the way they live that's very threatening because they're not that way. So fam families and broader cultures reinforce the behaviors that the, 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 the thoughts and the feelings and the behaviors that um, that have been in that culture for a very long time. And so there are massive forces against change. And that's why the self-help industry is something like a 13 billion dollar industry in industry because nobody's figured it out. But <laughs> yeah. but change is change is possible. It's just really hard because you need to clear out those forces that are, um, are holding you back, figure out how you want to be, and then, then, then figure out what strategies I need to do to, to do that. So example, Tyson, exercise. So somebody's overweight, 50 pounds overweight, and they want to start exercising. So they join a gym. And it's been a long day. And they go straight to the gym. And everybody in there is just beautiful and fit and buffed. And they're these schlubs. <laughs> and they think everybody's judging them, which they might very well be. So there's, a, there's an environmental situation that, again, makes it hard to stay motivated. Or you walk to work and you pass by Dunkin' Donuts and you always go into that donut. Well, if you keep walking by that donut shop, it's hard to not go in. So what do you do? You, you take a different route. And instead of joining a gym, maybe you do join a club, a fitness club of, of overweight people. I don't know exactly. But, but the idea is that you need to, you need to create a, an external environment that supports you. And more than anything, you need to want it bad. Because change mm. is hard. It's painful, like exercising. When you first start exercising, after you haven't exercised for decades, you smell bad, you're sore, you're in pain. It doesn't feel good. And you have to do it for a while until you actually start gaining the benefits. 
So again, yeah. all these forces against you and you need to marshal all the forces externally and internally to resist those, those, those unhealthy forces um, until you sort of, you sort of make a shift to it's sort of a tipping point, I suppose that, that you start to enjoy exercise, for example, or you, you start to enjoy couscous and tofu um, and, um, and, and, and whatever it is that you, that you're trying to do that, that, um, that's healthier. And then you start getting reinforced from the outside world. Gosh, you're looking really, really great these days, or you've been so much happier since you got that, that new job or whatever it might be. And, um, but again, um, it takes a lot of persistence, a lot of determination, a lot of resilience to failure. Because as with most things in life, it's the people who persist that end up succeeding. Because if you don't mm. persist, you're going to quit. And as soon as you quit, of course, you automatically fail. That's such a good point. Yeah, one of my favorite comedians said the other day, and I mean, I'm sure if you analyze this in a little more detail, it's probably not always true. But what he was meaning, he said, uh, if you don't quit, you win. And I thought, well, that's true to a degree. Obviously, it's as you said at the start of the podcast, it's, it's not going to it's not going to make you seven foot tall if you don't quit but it might help refine your skills and, and help you just, you know, get to a level that you wouldn't otherwise have gotten to. And it's such a good point. What you just said is, is so true. Like I, I often think about personal breakthroughs as all about us as individuals. I very rarely consider the fact that the external factors are, are really powerful as well. I have heard stories that, and I don't know how true this is, that you become the average of your five best friends and that, that tribe, whether or not that's true, you understand where that, where that sort of expression comes from, because it's obviously easy to be fitter if your five best mates are. If you walk in with a donut and uh, and a milkshake, they're going to start asking questions, uh, which right. which I like for the um uh, just that I guess that peer pressure element of of performance is good. Leverage is another one that I've found really helpful. I'm not sure. Um, I've never actually used it to a, a great degree, but my brother in law was trying to get involved in a gym. He's in Oregon, married an Oregon girl. And he said, mate, like when I'm with you, I'm, I'm all pumped to go to the gym. But when I'm not, uh, when we're not together, it's it's just one of those things I can't get into. I said, well, how about you put $1,000 in my bank account? And if you get, if you consistently go into the gym for, for uh, you know, twice a week for six months, I'll give it back. And if you don't, I get to keep it. And he goes, well, I, I stole this one from Tony Robbins. <laughs> but he goes, I'm not, I'm not that committed. Like I found that one really helpful as well. Just having something on, on the line that's going to cost you if you don't follow through. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there's. I know there's some apps that do the same thing, and so the idea is you're you're, you're financially incentivized to um, to engage in the behavior. You know, I, ultimately, external motivators <clears throat> can provide maybe some short term benefit, but ultimately, you have to have a reason to do it in it from a de very deep yeah. place, because yeah. otherwise, after a while, you'll you'll habituate or get, just get tired of the external motivators. And as far as your social group, hugely important. But here's an interesting twist on the five best friends. Remember that your five best friends, you chose them. So, so the chances are, if you're sedentary, they're mm. probably sedentary too. And, and what I tell people is that, that if you want to make a real big change in your life, you probably need to replace your family and friends. Because we choose people <laughs> yeah. that, 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 that align with what we value in our habits and so on. And so if, if, if you're 50 pounds overweight and you're sedentary, then you probably could associate with people who don't exercise. And who eat who eat really badly, and so that's why joining different clubs, um, you know, like a triathlon club, you know, not everybody does triathlons is in great shape at all, but they want to be, so they surround themselves with other people who are like minded, and they have their 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 um, Wednesday night workouts and their Saturday swims, and everybody's re supporting each other and reinforcing each other. So all of a sudden, you're getting different feedback from the world, like you just ran a lap. It's like, and, and, and you try to tell that to your family at home and they laugh at you like, what? Whereas you do it with a group and, and they go, you know, high fives and all that stuff. And so you need to make sure that your world supports your effort because if it doesn't, you're almost, unless in very rare cases, you're doomed. Because the pressure from the outside world, those messages, it's just hard to resist. Yeah, it really is. I was speaking to a girl I do comedy with last night. We were at a gig. And she was saying one of the things that really whacks her motivation is that success, especially in the comedy scene, it's not linear. Like the right. idea of last night, I'm not kidding. We were at a room uh, in Melbourne. It was an open mic comedy room. And it's just, a, I essentially call those ones, it's like a gym workout. I go there purely to try and refine my craft. And it's always humbling because no one's there for the comedy. They're there for a meal 
and they're there to catch up with friends and we get up with a microphone and it's like, all right, good luck making these people laugh. <laughs> but a couple of weeks before that, <clears throat> I was at a, a cinema gig and there was 300 people there. They were all there. They'd all paid to be there. They all wanted to laugh. They all loved it. Um, you get up there and you're like, oh, this is the easiest thing in the world. I can't believe how simple comedy is. But then what's so interesting, and I really appreciated what she said about success not being linear, is it's not just, okay, we do 100, then we do 300, then we do 500. It's like, okay, there's a gig coming up in a few weeks that might have a couple of hundred people. But in the lead up to that, you're going to be performing to seven people on a Tuesday night. <laughs> they might not know you're going to be there. And she said, just going, leaving a place like where we were at last night, she goes, I don't know. I don't know if I can keep putting myself through this. And yeah. I'm sure you can take that example and apply it to whether it's weight loss and the fluctuations that come with weight loss on your journey or fitness or motivation or what, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a so, lot of regards, yeah. 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 So Tyson, uh, I use the metaphor of the stock market, that, that you're going to have days where you fall off the wagon, whether it's with alcohol or exercise or, or treating people nicely. And y if you look at that as like a, a 300 point drop in, in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, part of our stock market here in the US. And mm -hmm. um, you look at that and it's like, why should I stay invested in this? But if you think about the stock market, if you if you go back and pull it back 50 years, and what do you see? You see an upward trend, but it's not linear like you suggested. It's up, up and down. Yeah, yeah. So you have to think big picture that if I keep investing in myself, and th it, there are going to be market crashes, metaphorically speaking, for sure sometimes, where you go for a week or whatever. And the problem with many people is that they, 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 they fall off the wagon of whatever they're trying to change. And they, uh, and they said, oh, I'm terrible, I'm weak, I can't do this. And they stop. Instead of, saying, like, instead of just saying, I had a bad day, but I've, I've done pretty well the last two weeks. So I'm just going to get back on it and keep at it. And so just like the stock market has ups and downs, yes, but it always moves upward. And that's the way life is because life mm. isn't linear. Life's not all good. And, and hopefully for most people, it's not all bad. But you want to make sure that hopefully it's, it's mostly good and it's mostly trending in the direction you want to go. And even if there, there are big market, mar market crashes, you know, it, 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 if you look at the stock market, after every the Great Recession, the Great Depression, all these things, it always comes back. And, and that's how we need to look at it ourselves is that we're, we're going to have bad days, bad periods. But if we keep at it, if we stay committed and stay invested, then our lives are going to continue in that upward trend again with ups and downs. Sure. That's such a great example. I often I often jump on. Uh, we've got the ASX over here, but from time to time, I'll jump on and see what's happening in America as well. And uh, the one thing that does give you a, a really good overview of the stock market, to stick with that metaphor, is just zooming out to a lifetime view of the chart. And you're right. It's, it's amazing just to see that constant growth. But when you do z zoom in, I was looking at Target the other day and thinking about how it'd be nerve wracking to be the CEO of Target in the States at the moment, because the last six months looked as, or the last th three months particularly, <laughs> have looked very, very difficult. Um, it, it is amazing just to how that correlates. Like sometimes maybe a, a broader picture of what it is you're trying to achieve is is really helpful. Maybe if you're caught too much in a down, your, your visions become too narrow. You need to take a step back and, and see it from a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like a bird's eye helicopter view. Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because in my work, I mean, I, I give athlete, I give the people I work with a lot of techniques and strategies, and help them with insights and, and epiphanies. But also, a lot of times, all I do is just give them another perspective. Because when when you're when you're in your life, whether it's as an athlete or just trying to make a change in your life, you know, you you can only look at the world through your own eyes because that's the only experience you have, and 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 that's obviously pretty limiting. And even even when it's bad, even when they even when they, at some level they know like this is not a good way to look at the world through again the unconscious forces that i mentioned it, they're, they're pulled out they're pulled into looking at the world that way and a lot of times all i'll do and this is something that's hugely important for parents because kids see the world this far and this wide there's this this far and this wide because they don't have a lot of life experience so what you can do is say i'll say just come over here and look at it from my perspective and I'll, 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 I'll spin it in a, in a way that I think is sort of realistic and healthy and positive. And they go like, whoa, I, didn't, I hadn't thought of that. And, and there's just like this massive relief because all mm. of a sudden they're not in this dark place anymore. There's like this hope, this possibility, like, like the, the world can be, I, I can be okay. And, and that's the same thing as pulling back the perspective on the stock market, which is your life. And, and looking at it in that big, big perspective and seeing that what happens today might be really dark, but 
typically dark things don't last it was with most people yes certainly people can spiral down to go to a very bad place but the vast majority of us we just have ups and downs and it's and it's it, it's easy to to live your life when things are going well because the world is reinforcing you it's when things are down that's the challenge whether you're losing a, a game or a race or you know you're struggling in your life but th there's always that capacity to to turn it around but of course that's within ourselves we have to make that choice we have to make the commitment and we have to persevere until we make the change. Yeah, actually, one of the most helpful tools that I ever have used is, or that was introduced to, was cognitive behavior therapy for the exact reason that you just explained. Yeah. Uh, the idea of, of sometimes, I, I often notice that with myself, if I'm in a little bit of a rut, regardless of whether it's comedy, parenthood, husbandhood, just life in general, it's because I've got some negative story that's been run through my mind and I've bought into it. Um, yeah. and, and I actually haven't done this as consistently as I should, but that one thing that I like to do is, is just try and offer that fresh perspective to myself. Sometimes I go and complain to my wife and hope she'll throw one at me. But <laughs> if I'm being responsible, I'll sit down with a notebook and a pen and I'll try and clarify exactly what it is that's causing the, the, the frustration in me and then try and write a couple of alternatives. And like what you said, it's amazing to do that. And it's very rare after I've done that for 10 or 15 minutes that I leave and don't feel better for it. Right. Yeah, for, for sure. And one thing that I've been doing lately, uh, in particular working with this one young lady who's uh, who's been struggling a little bit, is, um, is and this is a great thing where, where the internet can be beneficial, is um, like on Instagram. If you type in Instagram, let's say relationships or success or whatever, you get all these incredibly, what I consider to be, you know, really pretty deep and profound little statements. And, and think about how our minds, when we go to a, the, a dark place, are filled with a lot of little statements just little sentences i'm i'm not worthwhile i can't be loved you know i'm never going to find somebody whatever it might be um, i'll never be successful and and so you've got these little these little uh, uninspirational quotes if you will whatever the art opposite side of inspirational or motivational quotes and they're going through your head and so what i've been doing with, with some of my clients is having them bombard their brains with the exact opposite and so, you know, these the Instagram, they have these, the, you know, these little tiles of all these inspirational quotes and uh, on every different topic. And I say, I tell them, I want you to go into Instagram every day for five minutes. And, and in five minutes, you can come across, I don't know, hundreds of, of, of quotes and send them to me. Now, so the reality is that um, that my my Instagram um, inbox is is pretty darn full, but but <laughs> it, it, for, it holds them accountable and it forces mm -hmm. them to be constantly exposing themselves to messages that are contradictory to their view of the world. And so, in a way, you're like overwhelming the dark side, the little devil on your shoulder, with, with the angel on the other. And so, mm. and, and that's just a matter of like tipping the scale. So if you've had a tough life and you've always been down to yourself, the scale is tipped way over here. And so in a way, what this does, I, I, you know, I call it um, motivational bombardment is that you keep exposing yourself to these messages and you get more and more over here and until they start tipping this direction and, and the, the positive ones have just worn out and, 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 and removed the negative ones. And so that, that's a little strategy. Then it seems a little hokey because I, I'm, I can't say I'm a big believer in, in motivational talks and things like that. That's a whole other topic to discuss. But, um, but, but exposing yourself to messages that are counter to the way you view the world. It, 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 in a way, you don't have to generate it yourself. Instagram, in this case, is generating it for you. And you're being bombarded with like, I'm a value. I can be a success. I'm going to keep working hard. I can make this change, whatever the messages might be. Mm. That's such a that's such a good idea. That makes so much sense. Just the exposure to a brand new message to to change the way you perceive the world is uh yeah, yeah it's right. cool. Okay. Yes, because so often the stories that we're we're running through our mind are the issue. Completely, and and what that yeah. does is yeah. you're creating a new perspective, and you're retraining your brain to view the world from that perspective. And it takes a long time. I mean, people it can take decades. Um, but, but for most people, I think that if, if you make a commitment to it, I found in, in working with people who aren't mentally ill, that's a whole nother category. Um, within three to six months, they, if, if they commit to change, they can make the change. And then it, once it becomes habit and lifestyle as exercise can be healthy eating, um, hanging out with, with, with positive people, um, then it becomes just, you, you internalize it and it becomes who you are. 
and then that that then you're done and you're not you're not done you're always going to keep growing but you reach a point where it's like you've made that shift and your life is a whole lot better hmm. jim i could talk to you all day about this stuff but i understand it's uh it's getting late where you are we've already done an hour which has just flown by Really appreciate you coming on here, sharing all that. I mean, there's so many things that even as a bloke who's been fascinated by this scene his whole life, I, I took out of that. I'm going to go back and listen back to it, which is always a sign of a good podcast. So, man, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate you coming on. Great fun, Tyson. I'm happy to do it anytime. I love talking with people. I love sharing my ideas, but I also like talking to other people who are equally passionate about life and who want to grow and be their best. And so um, you're welcome to invite me back absolutely anytime. Awesome. All right. Hey, thanks a lot. I'll see you later. I'll see you later, everybody. Awesome, man. I'll end that one there. Jim, that was, uh, that was great. I